Продължаваме напред, като за нас е огромно удоволствие да представим следващия лектор. Той е един от основоположниците на професията QA. Джеймс Линдзи се занимава с тестване на софтуер от 1986 година. Аз съм била родена тогава, но някои от вас не са били родени тогава. Джеймс е автор на наградени научни статии, създател на Blackbox пазилите, стартирал е Test Lab и основен двигател на London Exploratory Workshop in Testing. Докарахме го от Лондон до тук, за да ни разкаже истината лично за един интересен подход как да тестваме с множество малки тестове. Ladies and gentlemen, James Lindsay! Аз казвам само малко български. Аз разбирам... Да, но стартът е в другата място. Аз разбирам само малко български, а се казвам по-по-малко. So I asked my wife to do some translating for me. I trust her completely. Let's see. Ще ви покажа един от начините, по който тества. То ми помага да изгледвам изкинко поведенеш на една система. This is going to take a long time. It's all like this. Lesson и дава много информация е, но е ограничен. Now, I'm stuffed with ограничен, because I've never found that word before, but I kind of know what some of the rest of it means. Um, I am a tester. I, I was asked earlier on by Martin, who is, I saw him around about here somewhere, who's some kind of leader of software thing, uh, about QA. And this is called QA Challenge Accepted, and I'm not. I'm not a quality assurance person. It's not a great idea to ask me to assure your quality because I'll say, where's your process that assures quality? And then we'll look at it and I'll go, well, that sucks. Didn't it slow you down a bit? I'm a tester. I find stuff. I find stuff that is of interest to people who are building things or indeed people who are buying things. That's what I do. I find stuff out. And I give that stuff as fast as I have information, as fast as I can, to the people who want it, so that they can then fix it while they still can. I try not to piss people off too much by giving them information really quickly. Not after six weeks, where somebody says, you know, we're about to sell this. And I go, yeah, you can't do that. It breaks the regulations. I don't do that. So this is a talk about how I use lots and lots of little tests to find things out, and they're very cheap, and they're very, very dull and very rubbish. Um, but I think that with, when I put them together, they make a set of measurements that turn into some kind of probe, and that probe can give me something my mind can handle so I can attach some kind of intelligence to my stupid tests. Now, I'm going to basically show you stuff, and then you're going to do some stuff. Uh, quick check, hands up if you've got an arm. <laughs> okay, now we can all do that, that's good. It's got the blood moving, this is after lunch. We might do that again if I see a few people flagging at the back, I'll throw things. Um, hands up if you've got a laptop with you. Okay. That's not very many of you testers. Never mind. Um, you'll notice, those of you with laptops, and unfortunately, I write currently an action script that's stopping this year, so those of you with phones and tablets, this won't work. You'll see an IP address and a web address up there. That's got things on to test. How many of you are testers? Okay, so not as many of you as have arms, <laughs> but still quite a lot. Any armless test? No, 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 let me not ask that. Um, I want you to ask me questions any time. Um, now, let me be clear about this. I have a big stage and a microphone. So you can ask me testers, and I can just talk straight over the top of you, so I'm not scared. Please do ask me any question any time you like. Uh, let's practice that. Um, so, after me. Kakvo evremeto, James? 
I'll count you in. One, two, three. Може би два часа и еднайсет. I can understand, I can reply. That's good. Okay, uh, brief other bit of Bulgarian. Um, now, I was talking with uh, a few people and they said, most of us, James, spend most of our time reading English. And I felt a bit stupid, having put these into my slide deck. Never mind. Um, I feel even more stupid knowing that you can read that and the English that I put up and then going, всички зная, че никога не получаваме това, което очаваме, тестери изледват тази връзка. I'm going to show you a diagram. This is basically diagram one of software engineering. Um, those of you who've studied software in Sofia, my guess is you were doing something more sophisticated than me. I didn't study software engineering, but everyone I talk to seems to agree this is diagram one. Uh, you've got a large set of things that you expect to get. Now, my expect to get is different from your expect to get, and our expect to get changes over time. But there's a set of things that we expect to get, and we know it's got some kind of boundary, because you go, we expected that, we mm, didn't expect this. And you can work sometimes through your expectations. You can go, I've got an expectation, let's check it. <laughs> yes. 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 No. And the one that comes out, no, means that you've lost some money. You invested some time in making a thing and you expected something of it and you didn't get it. Now, you expected that before you made it. You made it thinking of those expectations. I've noticed a man with a loud hater. You're going to ask me a question later. Excellent. You expect these things, like you expect a man with a loud hailer in the room, and you don't get it. That's a question of value. And if you spend your time, excuse me, pull my trousers up, if you spend your time working over this side, working through your expectations, you get to know that you've made something which is valuable and you've made a bit of it that's not very valuable. You can write all your expectations down beforehand as well, so that's great. You're off the critical path. We've also got the thing. The actual thing you get. Now, there are many opinions about that thing, but there's only one thing, usually, at a time. We make different things, and we release them as different versions of a product. There's the one thing that we've got, and we can ask lots of questions of it. Now, we can also, in the same way we work through our expectations, we can, wor we can work through what we have in front of us. Mm -mm 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 -mm. We are working through our deliverable, and we expect these things, and we didn't expect that. Well, what's that? That's not a lack of value, that's a surprise. <laughs> and off again, haven't I? Anyway, it's funny, but it's not actually meant to be a joke, so I'm disappointed. Um, surprises are important. It's good for us to recognize surprises because surprises hold in their hands risks. They certainly hold in their hands information. Sometimes we do things to the thing that we've made and it doesn't do what we want. It doesn't do what we expect. Those are two different things. Be aware that sometimes what we don't expect is indeed what we want. But that doesn't happen so often. So we've got two ways of working. We can work with our expectations or we can work with our deliverable. Should we do either? Should we do neither? You should definitely do both. Do both. Work with both of them. I go to lots of organizations as a consultant, a strategist, and I tend to find that some organizations do one and organi other organizations do the other. Do both. It works much better. You stand a chance of finding information about value and information about risk. You feed that back into your product and you're moving. So let's move on from that idea. Another one of these things. Let's not add an appropriate modern. Oh, hang on. Lesno e da se napraviat no gesto testove. Ako prozovite tezi testove da sa glupavi. Sega pred bas od nula ste napravio oko hila da testa na nešto nogo. What is that? <laughs> Složno. Okay, so I'm going to show you. A thousand tiny tests, a thousand tiny stupid tests. And you can follow along with this if you like. How much time have we got? We've got I've taken 10 minutes, though, okay? So I'll, I'll type quickly then. 
Uh, if you go to this IP address, and you'll go to Google Sheets, that's not something I made. I didn't make Google Sheets. Uh, this is where my typing goes a bit funny, because I don't have the screen that you've got. I'm going to make a thing. Uh, and this thing is going to be, uh, let's see, one. And over here we'll go equals char. Have I typed that correctly? Yes. And we'll say equals the char of that thing. Uh -huh. Done. And there's nothing there, because character of one doesn't really mean very much. And then we'll say a, because uh, for reasons that will become useful later, equals if brackets, we don't know what that is because it's the char of one, that and that, comma, true. Oh, hang on, need another comma. Easier to type when not talking. There was a problem. Excuse me, that's not the problem I was trying to show you. <laughs> Name, unknown function B. If B brackets one, uh, put the bracket in the wrong place, put the bracket in the right place. Think about it, James. There we are. Error. <laughs> Good. That's what uh, um, Formula Pars error. That's not quite what I was expecting because that's not what happened this morning when I tried this out. Uh, if B1, uh, what I need there is, of course, one of those. And we're done. Okay? Now, that's not a very interesting test. Tell me it's not an interesting test. That's not an interesting test, James. It's good, isn't it? The synchronization just doesn't work unless I count you in. Um, let's do that. Still not an interesting test. Let's make this into an interesting test. Everybody knows that Google Sheets does this, don't they? Uh, this isn't very interesting. It really isn't very interesting yet. Uh, let's uh, let go and see where we are. OK, so we're on sort of 300 and something. Let's pull that down, because I, I did promise you a 1,000 tests. <laughs> and it's fallen off the side of the screen here. Still going. Anybody call out when you reckon I'm at 1,000? Did the second 1,000 go faster than the first 1,000? Don't know. Anyway, I've generated 817 tests. Uh, boom. Uh, 926, that'll do. Right. Let me take those things that I've copied there, and for the sake of speed, because we're a little, little bit less far on than I want it to be, I'm going to tell you that if I copy any of these things and put them into a text editor, they just don't work. Indeed, if I copy that thing, it just doesn't work either. But I can take these, all these characters, trying to scroll with one hand on the key, with one hand and one hand looking, and it's difficult. Uh, please let me do this correctly with all these people watching me. Uh, copy. This is an easy test. You can all do this test. Do you think we're testing something simple here? Yeah? Let me hit edit copy just so I've got it. Copy. Thank you. These actions are unavailable by the agent menu. That's an interesting thing. Did you know that? No, nah, it's weird, isn't it? You have to do it by that. You can't use the menus to copy and paste because of, I think they're using some weird flash thing lying underneath because obviously you shouldn't be able to copy and paste out of your browser. That's dangerous. Uh, right. Don't do that. Do that. Thank you. Now I'm going to bring up TextMate. TextMate 2, indeed. Um, I'm going to give you the latest and greatest version of TextMate, which is very lovely. Pop it over there. Hello, there's TextMate. And we'll just paste those in. Uh, now, that's looking a little bit different. And um, we'll go copy. No, we'll do select all and copy. That's it. So we'll copy all those in. And we'll go back to this sheet. And we'll go up to where we copied it from, where it should be just the same place. And we'll start to see our tests work, I hope. Paste. Boom. OK. I've just done 900 and so tests. I think I was up to 900 and something or other. I'm not done me top 30 or so. Um, and we're starting to see some interesting stuff down here because, oh, hang on, I put it in the wrong place. Excuse me, should have put it there. That's better. So here's what I had calculated as lots of different characters just from a thing. And here's what has been given back to me by my text editor, and already something's not right. We can't copy and paste small inverted commas. No surprises, but worth remembering. What else have we got? Let's scroll down. Looks like everything else works. 
Do we think it all works? Might all work. Let's hit uh, format, conditional formatting. Uh, text contains, I would like to have, uh, don't fourth bottom there, is equal to false. Hopefully this is going to work. Background color. Flays. Can't spell my own thing. Background color. False. Okay, let's, let's do that. Let's save rules. Reply to any. Can we find any falses? There we are. Oh. And we start to see things. Did you notice we couldn't really see them scrolling down? We have to turn this on. We have to visualize. And now we're starting to see something a bit more interesting. Some things you can't copy and paste from a browser into a text editor and back in again. Now, I'm not hugely surprised by that, but it's good to know these. This is many, many, many tests. I can pull that down till we get to about 65,000 columns, 65,000 rows. It's very boring doing that with sheets because sheets ask you to extend every thousand, so you have to do that 65 times. It's not interesting. Um, but we've got things that don't work. And, interestingly, if I do this with a different text editor or in a different spreadsheet or, indeed, on a Windows machine, different things will not work from work here. Some stuff doesn't work. We've done thousands of tests, and those thousands of tests have told us interesting things. Not something we can use yet. This is not a bug. But it tells us stuff about what's going on. Now, this is a really complex system. Because Google Sheets is, uh, I think, a JavaScript application that's got hooks going off to some remote place where these things are stored. And it's running in a browser. And then I use copy and paste, which is deep inside the operating system, as we saw. And that then puts it into another bit of software, a text editor, then I paste it back in. And then there's a comparison. Well, I wrote the comparison. And you saw what happened there. This is a really complex bit of software. And these tests are in no way a useful, good, broad set of tests. But my guess is, because they're telling me something new, they're telling you something new as well. That's what I'm going to talk about. That's what I'm showing you, is lots of different, well, a few different ways, perhaps, of doing many, many tests and putting those tests together in a way that shows you something interesting, something useful, we hope, about what the application, what the thing you're testing actually does, the truth about it. Let me move on. A simpler example, which appears to be more complicated. Um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit and leave it really as an exercise for the reader. This simple example, let's have a look here. This is one that I built. Visible light. It takes in questions about visible light specifically about the frequency of visible light, and tells you what color that frequency is. It's not very interesting in the scheme of things. Uh, so if I put 550, it looks green. Good, perhaps, for learning colors. Not very good for anything else. Um, but I'll show you just the thing that this can do. So if I go um, 550 and 600, also looks green, I can test more than one thing. So. First bit of interaction. We've been going 20 minutes or so. You're nicely cooled down after lunch. Everything's processing. I'm going to ask you a question because I have the microphone. How would you test this? Room full of testers. Room full of professional testers. Man on stage running out of voice. So I'm going to have a quick drink of water, and you're going to shout out ways you test it. Everybody ready for that? Oh, there's some pained nods going on. How would you test it? Quick go. Bloody drowning here. <laughs> it's interesting. Whenever I ask this question of a large group, people can't tell me. Whenever I ask it of a small group, I get loads of answers. Loads of answers. Some of those answers involve a scripting language. How many of you use Python or Ruby? Yeah, a few. How many of you use Apple Script? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> some of you might script things. You might create a list of numbers. 
Some of you might do exactly what I did with sheets and go to sheets and drag, grab hold of one corner and pull down. And my question then is, what number do you start with? Call a number out, people. It'll be anonymous. Nobody will know. Where do you start? Zero. Of course you do, because you're testers. I'm so proud. That wouldn't work with a Lavalier mic. With the mic. Um, so, yeah, although it says between 400 and 700 hertz, terahertz, testers say zero. Thank goodness. Some testers say minus one. Because minus one hertz is meaningful to me. Um, so th that's, what they, you know, that's what testers do. So you start at zero. Where do you finish? Infinity. Infinity terahertz. I'll point out. And do you, uh, what step do you go up in? Between, excuse me, b between zero and infinity. What's the gap? One. One hertz at a time does hurt, doesn't it? Um, yes, okay, so that's going to take us a while. But it's going to tell us some things. Um, as it happens, uh, I've put a thing in here that you can't see, but I can, because so, I know where it is. Um, so we can go from zero to... Pick a number that's not infinity. A billion. How about just that many zeros? I think that's a billion. And we'll go up in steps of one because you've asked for a billion rows of data. Clever boy. <laughs> oh, but there's, it's done, it's done some. It's done some. What's it telling us? What do we know? What do we know now about this thing? How big are our holes in the coverage? Bloody huge. But we know it does stuff. We know it's changed from terahertz to picohertz. It's says something about soft hard rays and hard x-rays and stuff. There's things, that behavior changes you can see there. Just from doing that. Just from doing that particularly, forgive me, whoever it was called it, a stupid test. But that's my point, is that you use these as really stupid tests. And you find stuff out. Now, as it happens, I can look at that and say, look, there's a difference between what I could see in the visible range and the thousand things, everything else seemed to be low numbers, so I can look at the difference between soft x-rays and hard x-rays and visible light, or I can look at the boundaries when it moves from displaying something as three digits of PHZ to one digit of EHZ. I can look into all these things. And indeed, I appear to have skipped from one to a million terahertz, which is a lot of hertz. In one jump, there's got to be quite a lot between that one and a million hertz, particularly if I choose to go at smaller gaps. There's lots that you can do with these things. This is very easy testing to set up, and it reveals lots of stuff. This is available for you at that IP address, which I was showing earlier on. You can have a fiddle and a play. You'll find stuff in it. It is filled with bugs. How do I know it's filled with bugs? I wrote it on an airplane. I was going from Istanbul to Sofia on Tuesday. It was horrible. Um, so do play with that. That is a... That's a, a, a nice little thing to play with in terms of exploring how you deal with bulk. You look at your start, you look at your end, you look at the range. I've noticed that all these things are numbers you put in there. Maybe you can put in things that aren't numbers. Are you going to put in sequential numbers or random numbers? Are you going to be exhaustive? Are you going to sample things? Are you going to sample those things regularly or irregularly? All those questions are good questions to ask as a tester. I don't know about QA, but they're good questions to ask as a tester. The problem is... How do you know what's in there? All that text revealed things to us because we could see big blocks. Let's have a look. I'm going to read you some more Bulgarian. It goes, Edno testove koi to napizaš za moja software, elementarnite testove ne mi požaka problema. Požaka mi go glupavite testovite. I'm going to show you something of mine now. Um, the other thing was mine uh, before, of course. Uh, this is a test. This is a unit test. Uh, some of you will have heard of Michael Bolton. Yes, I've heard of Michael Bolton. I enjoy 80s ballads. Some of you will have heard of Michael Bolton. Yes, I enjoy the debate between testing and checking. How many of you have heard of that, Michael Bolton? I hope more of you will go off and read. It's interesting stuff. Michael Bolton is at developsense.com. Very bright, interesting man. Thank goodness he's in testing. 
Um, keeps him out of trouble elsewhere. This is a set of checks, and with this, I have t checked a routine that I wrote to turn colours again into words. And these colours were given to this thing as a 24-bit colour value. And you can see that it checked it, and it said black when everything was zero, and white when everything was Fs. And I think you've probably got a grey when everything is 7F, and all these checks succeeded. You also notice I've got two columns up there. One's called the right colour sensor, and one's called the wrong colour sensor. I'll show you the wrong colour sensor. Now, bear in mind that this thing worked with all its checks. Here's the wrong one. Now, I can give this sensor a field of colour, and I can change that field of colour quite a lot. And you'll be looking, I hope, at the left-hand field of colour. But I know that you're not looking at the left-hand field of colour. You're looking at the right-hand field of colour, going, what's going on there? Because that's clearly rubbish. This thing is to tell me where blue is. Where's blue software? It's here, Dad. No, it's not. It's here. Look, where's black software? It's in a ring here, Dad. No, no, it's really not. This software is broken. And I built it broken because I'm rubbish. But never mind. So I built this broken software, and I didn't know it was broken because it passed all its bloody checks. But when I probed it with thousands and millions of tests, the problem became immediately apparent. Let me show you what it should look like. You think you'll know. Obviously, there's a big chunk of bl black and a big chunk of green. And if I move these things around, you'll see that stuff moves around there on the, the probe output. That's what it should do. But I could only tell that it was doing it wrong, either because I found loads of bugs and it was frustrating me, or because I built a probe to tell me what was going wrong. As testers, I think we should be able to build these probes. Now, I'm going to show you a better example than that. Now, the better example, work, you rotten thing. The better example is not mine. And that's true about many things that are not mine and they're better, um, but also because we take, our, we take our cues from industry, we take our cues from other people who are working. This is a guy called Mike Bostock. Tova e podobre, what's that word? Uh, Primer. Mike Bostock. Mike Bostock does the visualizations for uh, the New York Times. He also wrote a plugin uh, library rather called D3, which is the primary visual visualization library I would go to. Mike wanted to visualize a shuffle. And the means that he chose to visualize a shuffle, everybody familiar with what a shuffle is? You take an array that's in order, you put it through a shuffle, it's not in order anymore. Yeah? It's the opposite of a sort. It's kind of, you know, shuffle, sort, shuffle, sort, shuffle, sort. You're basically wasting heat. Um, so he decided to do that by means of a visualization matrix. And what he did was he used the shuffle a lot, I think 100,000 times is what was going on, going on here. And then he went to see if the element that had been at position zero was in position zero as often as it should be, or indeed as rarely as it should be. And so we drew a matrix. I'll show you the matrix. Da -da, da -da. One of those. Please work. There we are. Will it shuffle? Those of you who've seen Will it blend? Similar kind of thing. Um, so this is Will it shuffle? This is what it should look like. This is a Fisher Yates sort, so a Fisher Yates shuffle, and you'll notice the matrix is mainly grey. Uh, each of these 30 wide matrices, this 30 wide matrix has been shuffled a hundred thousand times, and each of those times they've taken stats to say, has the zeroth element shown up in the zeroth position very often? Um, if we would chose to use no shuffle at all, that's what it would look like. The zeroth element shows up in zero all the time, and everything else doesn't. So we're looking at shades of green and red. Green means it's there too often, red means it's there not often enough. Fisher Yates does it. This is a sort that Microsoft were using. And they were using this uh, as part of a European Union uh, directive to give people random choice of browsers. Uh, so you can choose your browser from Microsoft. Microsoft chose a short that did the following. Um, 
for those of you who want me to interpret, you see the red blob up in this corner? This means that the zeroth element didn't show up very often in the zeroth position, and it didn't show up very often in the end position either, but it showed up quite a lot in the middle. Make sense? That's what that did. It's a stupid short. It's a rubbish shuffle. Has anybody got their laptop open and working on this? That's a shame. If I got you to look at this with Firefox, you'd see a completely different pattern. Same with Chrome. And yet the code is exactly the same. That is the code. It's clearly very stupid. If you're reading the code, what it's doing is saying, if a random number is random enough, swap. Well, that doesn't really actually shuffle anything. Um, it does if you swap it with a random one, but it's just swapping twos at once. But that's what Microsoft did. Uh, that's the shuffle they used, and this is the information that tells us that that shuffle is biased. If you open it up on Firefox, you open it up on Chrome, it's completely different. This is a big visualization. How many things have we got visualized there? We've got 30 by 30. That's 900 individual measurements across. I've got this set up to run 10,000 separate tests, 10,000 separate shuffles. And it takes, click, two, three, that long. Some of these tests don't take long to run, so that is uh, 100,000 times 900. That's getting on for a billion separate operations that are being checked and it's being checked like that, and we can see something's wrong. Can you check it if you do just one? Absolutely not. You just can't make it work. You can't get the information out of it. So what Mike Bostock was doing there, and what I did with my thing, was to visualize the output, to make the output graphical. That's useful to us because we have um, extraordinarily interesting visual processing. We deal with a vastly information-rich world, mainly by sniffing it, feeling it, looking at it. And we look at software. And so that's one of the reasons why visualization, visualization is useful for us when we start dealing with these many, many tests. So I will summarize that in Bulgarian, if I may. Akos lojim rezultatite od testa ko v ilustracija. Možkut niga osmilja po dobre. No ponjakoga e trudno da izberem i kuzdatem tazi ilustracija. Choosing and making the picture can be really hard. Now, we've got, I think, two minutes left of the talk. So I'm going to throw this open to you. I've used two dimensions to show you some visualizations. Some of you, as testers, will have used other things to visualize your testing. I'm going to ask you to, that's a terrible word, I can't say expose yourself in public, I don't want to do that. I'm going to ask you to not embarrass yourself, because this is about your real work. How have you visualized your testing results? How would you visualize testing results? Maybe is more embarrassing, but how have you done it already? Have anybody, has anybody tried visualizing and test results of a lot of tests? How have you done it? There's, I heard a passport. Pie chart, pass fail. Yep. I'm very sorry, man in a pink shirt. I don't want to push you too far. Is that, was that with the other hands up? Because you're not looking very comfortable. Mm. Okay. So typically, when I'm looking to visualize, we're visualizing in two dimensions. My Bostock's thing there was basically in a, a matrix comparing self against self to see where stuff was, and it indicated that with color. Color was the third dimension. We do a lot of work with stuff that with, with things that change over time. Once we start to put time, generally on the horizontal axis, we start to see trends. And anybody who's read, have you heard Edward Tufte? T-U-F-T-E. Tufte talks about visualization a lot, and writes about visualization beautifully, and has the most gorgeous books, of course. Tufta will tell you all sorts of pitfalls and usefulnesses that you can have around trends and your scales that you use. You can visualize two variables against each other and then animate how they move over time. You'll see that in things like predator-prey diagrams. You can do three by changing the size of the blobs or the color. You can start using labels. All these things help you visualize what you've got from your tests. 
Excel may not cut it. I tend to use something called um, Awful Moment on stage. Word goes out of your head. Uh, it's a big draft gra graph drawing application on the Mac, and it costs about $40, and I usually recommend it. Um, and it's completely gone for me. Lots of people, though, write their own. And you can see with Mike Bostock's thing that he's written that for himself. That's just a straightforward table with the backgrounds colored in. And then you can use lots of his library D3 to visualize things, should you wish to. I think it's a great, quick way to make things work. So, Interesno, mi edachuya, vash... Hello. Did you leave the alarm turned up? Yeah. You did, okay. <laughs> well, at least we both know. Interesno, mi edachuya, vash you can read this, can't you? That's what I'm going to say. Um, so, questions, thoughts, statements, ideas. I do this. You're an idiot. Please go away. Um, we've got 10 minutes worth of questions. You've got microphones. I'll try and moderate any conversations or discussions because I still have the mic. Um, running man. Yes, sir. Hello, James. Uh, Hello. I've heard that you've mentioned the book of, of uh, Edward of the regarding yes. the uh, displaying of the quantitative information. He's got four, that's display, that's, that's yeah, one of them yeah. is called display of quantitative information. Uh, do you really find it uh, useful for the QAs? Yes, visual explanations in particular. Um, I, uh, now, uh, I'm going to call it, yeah. I mean, uh, aside from the uh, reporting, aside from the reporting, I mean to gain information about the system and the behavior. I I think that his stuff on Sparklines can be useful for reporting things like that. But specifically where I find it useful is the, the most common graph we use as testers uh, is a trend of response time over time. Mm -hmm. So you start testing and you see what the response times are and then a couple of hours later here there are the response times and you plot them on a diagram and they go up and down. They may be a bit fizzy, their fizziness may change. Tufty stuff on graphs has really helped me make those into something that's useful. In particular, um, his uh, elements of um, the gradient. Your primary gradient in your graph should be round about that, because if it looks like that or looks like that, you won't see what's going on. And so I found that very useful from Tuffy. And another one, uh, because you didn't mention uh, applying any techniques, uh, input domain techniques uh, combined with this. Oh, so did I not? No. Did I not ask you what your start and end values were and whether you'd go randomly or sequentially, whether you, what kind of gap you'd choose? Uh, you can choose exponential gaps if you want to get fun. Uh, yes, but I mean... Uh, Do you have an idea? You didn't, you didn't mention how to combine this with the input domain techniques and uh, at least with the most familiar ones. Tell me what you mean by the most familiar input like domain the techniques. Equivalence partitioning, boundary value analysis, and so on. That's a very nice question. Um, so one of the reasons I didn't do that is that that frequency thing is built from something that I, uh, advert I teach. Uh, not always. Uh, I tend to teach four or five times a year. So you know. um, when I teach, I used to teach things called, um, I still do teach things called uh, binary searches. And you've, if you've got a big range and stuff changes over that range, then you take one end of the range, you take the other end of the range, and you say, are you two the same? You're not the same. Okay, well, if you two are different, I'll take the middle point, I'll see if you're the same as either of the other two. And if you're not the same, I'll take another two middle points, and on you go. And that binary search is a very quick technique for finding your way down to where behavior changes. I teach it as something that comes out of uh, genuine black box. When people talk about equivalence class partitioning and boundary value analysis, that implies you already know what the equivalence classes are and you know where the boundaries are, too which means it is not a black box technique, it's a white box technique. Um, and white box technique gets me cross because actually we're talking about closed box and open box. Let me rewind. I used to teach that, and I still do teach it as a binary search. It's a quick way to find these things. But it's nothing like as quick as taking a spreadsheet, getting a thousand values, and just pasting it in. Nothing like as quick. It's a really nice technique, and if you've got an algorithm that's doing it, that's even better. But actually, next to vr copy paste what? It's rubbish. So that what I teach now is closer to what I, to what I had there with frequency, which is to give people a bulk input. Although it looks like a single input, give people a bulk input, and you can make ten thousand different tests all at once, and that'll tell you where those edges are. Um, yeah, that's all right. All right, uh, one more question, maybe. We have time for one more question. 
на български. Още въпроси. Имаме време за един въпрос. Yeah, go, go ask me a question in Bulgarian. I'll be able to understand that. <laughs> If it's about food or weirdly folk singing, I can probably understand it. Um, I would say that uh, there are that, that page that was on screen will that right here just yeah, step for a while. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the page will stay up for a bit if you want to play with toys. <laughs> And there are some extra toys there that I've not shown you. In particular one that does draw two dimension that draw graphs of response rate over time. There's lots of questions that you can ask over that. Yes sir. Hello Jim. Hello. Uh, you can shout at Jim, do you want to use mine? Tell me and I'll quote it back so the rest of them can fit can hear. Hello. Hello. Uh, how did you end up uh, finding this issue with the copy paste in in the beginning, I mean? I don't think it's an issue. I think I know it's there. Um, I knew it wouldn't work. Yeah, but what, what how did you find yeah. it? Did you copy at uh, the first place something and you found that uh, it's not the same and you you made mm -hmm. that to 1000 tests or I don't know. Let me tell you what I did. I needed an exercise to show people. I needed to show them something that looks very simple but actually is very complicated. And I thought for a while and sort of left it in the back of my head and that was what my head came up with. Now, when I tried it for the first time, the whole thing went... <laughs> and it went wrong because that first one through 32, you can't copy and paste at all. No, no text editor that I know will take those characters. TextMate takes some of them but not all of them. Then it failed because I tried to copy and paste an invert a, a double inverted comma. Yes, I, that's what yeah. that was my question. And that Did takes that takes it out of sync. So that's why I started at line 34 rather than line 32. Because in the extended version of this, I make all those mistakes on stage. Um, and that's necessary because I think it's worth seeing those mistakes made. Because actually, if you're talking about making these very large numbers of tests, The problems that you find in making them can be informative too. Um, and I'll give you a, an interesting example from the bulk thing. As I was trying to write a little bulk generator, uh, I usually use scripts and stuff, and I usually go up in integers. I thought, I won't go up in integers this time. I'm giving people a step that they can decide on. I'll go up in whatever their step is that they decided. So I tried going up in steps of 0.01. Now, those of you who know how binary works will know that binary can't store fractions very well. So if you take the number one, and you add 0.01 to 1, it doesn't really look like 1.01. It looks like 1.01. And then you add it on again, it looks like 1.01. And all sorts of things turn up. And so I put this in front, because I, I, I liked that, so I put it in front of a group of testers at uh, something called Let's Test Benelux last week. And they had a great time testing my data input, and they didn't test the data output at all. Because as I tried to create all this data, I found interesting issues that I should have known about and thought about, about how binary is stored. Because that's what I should have been doing. So yeah, you find lots of problems as you're getting there. Are you, you and I are going to have a chat later. Yeah, all right. Are we done here? Can you let me go? Yes. <laughs> You're right. free to go. Uh, Thank you. Applaudissements for James. <laughs>